Okay, we'll get started back up. Um, for the first hour, I thought I had recording activated. It didn't, it didn't record anything the first hour. Um, anybody needing to get that hour, um, just look back to September the 3rd, 2020. You can catch that hour up there. I'm recording now, so from here out, it will be recorded. So September 3rd, 20, is where you go back to to find the first hour. We're going to pick it with defamation. Defamation is communication of false information that damages person reputation. The two classes of that would be libel and slander. Libel are things you write, slander are things you say. <clears throat> Defamation, defamation could come from a false statement on your PCR or um, inappropriate comments you post to social media or or during um, during the time you sit around the, the station talking smack about people uh, that could be considered slander um, so just be careful what you say what you write what you post when you run reports you want the documentation to be um, Factual and relevant and, and accurate as possible. And any communications that you uh, that you have about your patients, just be sure that you're you're giving that communication to people that are truly authorized to be reading it or hearing it. So the Good Samaritan Law uh, and some immunity you can get. Um, if you reasonably help another person, you shouldn't be held liable for errors and omissions. Um, I generally won't say will not be or cannot be on most things because you could really just about sue anybody for anything. It may not go far enough that you'll get an actual judgment. It could be dismissed, but you know, it'll be a headache to you and at the least. But generally, the Good Samaritan uh, will help you, help shield you from most of that. So to get that protection under the Good Samaritan law, um, there's some conditions that has to be met. You acted in good faith while rendering your patient care. Um, you rendered care without expectation of compensation. You stayed within the scope of your training and you didn't do anything in a grossly negligent manner. Uh, gross negligence is um, it's con conduct that's um, constitute willful or reckless disregard for the person. Um, disregard for your duty and your standard of care. There's another group of laws that grant immunity from liability to official providers. Uh, your laws will vary locally and by your state, so always just uh, consult with your medical director and, and know your local guidelines and your state laws on those. You should always compile um, a complete and accurate record 
of all incidents involving sick or injured patients. Um, that record, that, that PCR is, is going to be important to help safeguard you against any possible legal uh, complications. So if you go to a court, uh, the court's going to consider an action not recorded as not performed. So if you don't document it, it didn't happen. So you may very well have performed an intervention, uh, let's just say traction splint. You, you very well may have put a traction splint on, but if you don't document that you put that traction splint on, when you go to court, you didn't document it, it never happened. So be sure, it's very repetitive, but you know, just be sure everything you do is, is thoroughly and accurately documented. Your PCR is gonna save you when you come to your, your, your court issues. Um, incomplete and tidy reports is evidence of poor emergency care. Um, you can provide the highest level of care. If you use horrible grammar, um, poor spelling, it's 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 gonna look um, it's gonna look sloppy to to the people involved, and they're gonna assume that you didn't actually provide a high level of care. So just take time with your documentation. Um, our system has a spell check. If you click a button at the end, it spell checks everything. Um, if you have that feature, always use a spell check. Just take time and care with your reports and make them look really good and thorough, and you won't have any problems. So you have the NIMSIS, which is the National EMS Information System. Um, it provides the ability to collect, store, and share standardized EMS data through the United States. Um, it's used to improve the speed and accuracy of data collection. So according to NIMSIS, they have, they have target data uh, data sets that they require you to include in your documentation. Um, if you're using the electronic PCRs, most of those uh, systems have the rule set already programmed to it where you're not able to complete the report if you're missing a uh, NENSYS required field. Um, 15 years ago, it was a little bit bigger deal with how you recorded and documented things. But now, um, with just about everybody being electronic, those charts are, are um, they're set up where you can't complete it and submit it until you go back and uh, include the missing information and missing data that the NENSYS requires. Special mandatory reporting requirements. Uh, again, these will vary by state, but most states have a minimum um, reporting obligation that you have to report the things that you see. Um, child abuse, elder abuse, um, abuse of the mentally um, mentally challenged populations, any abuse of those, abuse, neglect, those are all reportable. You're obligated to report those to your uh, DHS, DPS, APS, whatever your local state calls it. Um, some states require you to report injuries sustained during the commission of a felony. So if somebody tries to carjack an individual, then the individual 
puts a nine millimeter round through their leg, you're going to be um, under an obligation to report that injury, depending on your local uh, policies, drug related deaths, childbirth. You also have a, obligations report attempted suicide, dog bites, uh, people with communicable diseases, assaults, domestic violence. Where I work, I believe dog bite is probably the only true reportable one. Um, assault and domestic violence those don't automatically get reported unless the person actually comes in and agrees to that. Um, so somebody shows up at the hospital with their spouse or whoever they're living with has, has assaulted them, they're not immediately, the law is not immediately called and that's reported to. Um, they're always asked, do they want to report it? And if they choose to report it, then we'll call and report it. But where I'm at, we keep this under their their right to privacy. So just know your local guidelines on that. <clears throat> You'd also report sexual assaults, rapes, uh, exposure to infectious disease. Uh, transport of patients and restraints. Uh, you report the scene of a crime and deceased. Um, so just like the rest of them, those all vary depending on your location. So when you get to working, you'll you'll have a better understanding of what your state or what your area what guidelines they work under. Your ethical responsibilities. Um, we'll talk about ethics. Ethics is the, the philosophy of right and wrong, moral duties, and ideal professional behaviors. Um, in addition to your legal duties, you have um, you have ethical responsibilities. Um, it's going to be required of you as a health care provider. You have responsibilities to yourself, your co-workers, the public, and your patients. Um, morality is the code of conduct that affects character, conduct, and conscience. Bioethics specifically addresses ethical issues that arise in the presence and the practice of, um, of health care. Uh, as an EMT, you will, re you will encounter um, some ethical dilemmas throughout your career. Um, the, these um, dilemmas will require you to evaluate and apply ethical standards. Quick examples of good ethical standard would be be honest in your reporting, uh, keep your keep your accurate reports, keep accurate records. Okay, um, as being an MT, there may be times that you end up in court. You can either be a witness or defend it. Um, Hopefully most times you'll be a witness to a crime or, or, or something more than being a defendant because that means you have done broke the law or someone is suing you. Um, so just know you can go to to court in a criminal matter or civil matter. Um, I think I've been subpoenaed to court three times maybe in 
16 years so that's not too bad um i never had to testify in any of these um proceedings mainly because um when i was subpoenaed to court they did not subpoena subpoena my um uh, my pcrs so I'm not willing to talk about anything based off memory. Um, I believe I have a little, um, little early onset dementia, so I have a real struggle in my memory, and I'm not going to testify in a court case based off memory if they don't bother to subpoena my PCR where I can read it and refresh refresh myself because honestly, most times after after a week or two, I've pretty much recycled everything I've seen and I'm making new memories of the new patient. So um, if they don't have that for me to review before I, I testify, there's not really that much I could say in court under oath that I truly uh, remember. So if you're ever, if you're ever called to court to testify, if you have a good memory, then good enough. Do what you feel like you need to do. But as a paramedic, and I'm writing a report, um, you know, by the time something hits the court, it may be eight months have gone by. I just I can't accurately recall what I saw, what I've done, what I documented eight months ago without without them getting that record for me to look at. So. Um, So if you do go to court and do remember, that's fine. But um, if you're writing reports and they want you to testify on something that's written in a report, be sure you have a copy of your um, your report. Your agency should probably have attorney on retainer. It's always a good idea to uh, to speak with them before you go to court. Always t tell your supervisors that you've been subpoenaed, uh, and they should arrange your services, your hospital's attorney, to kind of talk you through that process. So if you do actually make the stand as a witness, um, Try your best to remain neutral. You don't want to be seen as, as biased in your testimony. <clears throat> if you're getting sued, you definitely want to have an attorney. Or if you're being criminally charged, you definitely want to have an attorney. Um, a criminal case, you, you probably uh, will be stuck getting your own representation. Um, Civil cases, whoever you work for probably will provide you with an attorney. Um, they kind of have a vested interest as well because if you're getting sued, they're getting sued. So they will, they will probably make uh, legal representation available to you. Some, some defenses may include statute of limitations. Um, Different crimes have different amounts of time they can be charged. You can be charged for committing. Um, I don't know the hard numbers, but I'll just say, for example, um, assault has an 18 month statute of limitation. They have to file a charge within 18 months. Somebody tries to uh, put a charge on you for something you did two years ago. That's 24 months, so 24 months would be past 18 months of uh, statute limitations. So it was not filed timely, that, that will be dismissed. You may have some governmental immunity that will protect you and the charge will be uh, dismissed outright that way. Uh, contributory negligence is a legal defense that may be raised when the defendant feels the conduct the plaintiff somehow contributed to the injuries or damages sustained by 
the pet, the plaintiff. Just a little quick rough example of that. Somebody jumps off a two-story balcony and shatters their femur. You know, they kind of contributed to their own injury. Um, it wasn't something you necessarily did that caused their injury. The discovery, the discovery phase of the trial is the opportunity for both sides to obtain more information to reach a better understanding of the case. Um, the two types can be uh, either written or verbal. The oral or depositions, the written or entered. Uh, Tongue time myself again. Interrogatories. Um, most commonly, um, I've seen depositions. They'll bring you into a room, ask you questions, and have a camera on you, recording you while you answer. The majority of cases are settled during the during are settled following the discovery phase. Uh, if not settled at that point, the case goes to trial. Uh, then damages may be awarded. They could be compensatory damages or punitive damages. Um, most all civil suits are going to be settled out of court. Regardless of any faults of you or your service, um, their insurance companies are, are usually uh, going to be inclined to settle. They work a they work a formula up and they decide that um, the defense of the of the case is going to cost fifty thousand dollars and if they lose they're going to be on the hook for two hundred thousand dollars and they offer a seventy five thousand dollar settlement and another party takes it seventy five is a lot cheaper than potential two fifty so they're they're always inclined to settle and not admit any fault but basically hush money. We didn't do anything wrong, but it's, it's going to cost too much to go to trial, so we'll give you a little something to make you go away. Your compensatory damages are um, money that's paid to the plaintiff for the injuries he or she sustained that you caused. Uh, punitive damages um, Or kind of um, kind of your punishment. It's to uh, deter you from repeating the behavior. So they tax you a little bit financially to serve you a, a lesson not to do it again. Most cases of judgments rendered against you, uh, your service or in, your insurance carrier is going to pay the pay the uh, the judgment out. And by chance you are charged criminally, um, seek the services of a, a a good, experienced criminal defense attorney. Like I said, in civil cases, the, the service has a, a joint interest with you to protect themselves from a big settlement or a big um, a big monetary award. So they're going to represent you more times than not. But criminally, they're, you're in the wind, so to speak, uh, to yourself. So find the best lawyer you can afford if you're charged criminally. Come to our review questions. You arrive at the scene of an older woman complaining of chest pain and assessing her. She holds her arm out for you to take her blood pressure. This is an example of 
give a few seconds and we'll discuss the answer. All right, it looks like everybody's pretty much in agreement. It's letter C. With express consent, it doesn't have to be verbally. It could be a nonverbal gesture, just like the arm holding out. You want to do an assessment that she expresses her willingness to follow along by holding her arm out for you. <clears throat> Which of the following represents abandonment? All right, most everybody's got this one. Um, the transfer of care and abandonment, I always remember it has to be equal or higher level. In this case, it's D. The AMT transfers care to a uh, MR. So in advance, hands the care off to a first responder, which is not uh, equal or higher. So that's the case of abandonment there. Unauthorized confinement of a person is called. I think that was pretty cut and dry. Everybody should know that is false imprisonment. The failure of the EMT to provide the same care as another EMT with the same training is called. Yeah, that was a pretty easy one too. It's gonna be C. A year old boy was struck by a car is unconscious and bleeding from the mouth. A police officer tells you that he is unable to contact the child's parents. You should. The answer is A. Anytime you have a minor, you're unable to contact the parents or guardian. Go ahead with your care and treatment based on the implied consent. Okay. Pick the advanced directive. Okay, answer is C. Written document signed by the patient and witness that specifies medical care that should be provided if the patient loses decision making capacity. Now, the, the medical power attorney 
if they lose the decision making capacity. That would be when the medical power of attorney comes online. Otherwise, it's still going to be with the patient. Which of the following is competent and can legally refuse care? And the answer is going to be C. Ever with a broke leg, you would probably really want to do your best to get her to consent to, to transport and treatment. But Sometimes they refuse to go regardless of what's in their best interest. Um, so try your best to, to get them. If you need to, call med control and see if they can help talk a little reason to them. One of the places I work at, the med control number is, um, is recorded. So when you have a case where somebody needs to go and is just adamantly refusing to and you call, um, you'll also have access to that recording where you and or the, the med control doctor uh, try to convince the patient to consent. So that, that would be another, another part of the documentation that would help you if a, a lawsuit come up as a result of a refusal. Uh, I'm not saying call on everyone because the doctor wouldn't want to get a call every time he wanted to sign a refusal. But when they truly need care, uh, I always like to call that recorded line, and then that's just another leg I had to stand on to protect myself from a from a frivolous lawsuit. You're treating a patient with apparent emotional crisis. After the patient refuses treatment, you tell him that you will call the police and have him restrained if he does not give you consent. Your actions are an example of. And it's going to be A, assault. Assault is threat. Battery is an actual action. If the EMT has a legal duty to act if he or she <clears throat> All right, that's just going to be B. Which of the following statements about records and reports is false?
So let's read it again and, and, and look at the answers and try that one more time. Which of the following statements about a report is not true? I was getting a lot of B's the first time. Um, the answer is going to be D. Your patient care does not become a part of the patient's hospital record because your treatment was provided outside the hospital. That statement is false. Your patient care report uh, becomes a part of that patient's permanent medical record. Um, if you're on paper, you do a paper chart, tear them off a copy and leave the receiving hospital a copy. Uh, if you're on an electronic chart, um, some places have a printer where you'll print it. Um, the vast majority, um, you complete it, save it to your server, then your server automatically faxes it or some other means transmits that report to whichever hospital you took it to. Um, usually it's saved on some some remote remote server somewhere they can always access it later if they need to but your report um, always remains a part of that that patient's permanent medical record at that facility so even more reason to um, do a good thorough accurate legible articulate report I missed over it uh, earlier in the lecture um, with capacity, capacity to refuse, um, or just establishing um, their general capacity. And a quick, easy way to do it, there's a thousand different ways you can ask them how many dollars in a quarter and who's the president what year we're in all kind of things but a, a real quick thing to do um, is you can you can tell them tell the patient to point to the floor after they point to the ceiling if they can do that their their, their mental acuity is pretty sharp um, so if, they're, if, if you tell them that and they point to the ceiling, then point to the floor, then you know they're with it. If they start to point to the floor, then point to the ceiling, they still got some, they still got some brain cells firing off. So um, one or two, you, know, you can be fairly certain that they, they have some, they have some capacity. Most people you tell them, Point to the point to the ceiling after you point to the floor. Point to the floor after you point to the ceiling. They're going to get the order wrong um, if they're altered, or they're just simply not going to be able to process what you're telling them to do. And they'll be pointing off and left field and right and up and everything in between, or they just sit there and look at you. Uh, point to the floor after you point to the ceiling. If they can perform that. Even if they do it wrong and they, in short order, realize they just didn't listen and didn't do it properly, those two people, you can you can be pretty sure um, they have some good capacity. Um, well, my chat is froze up again. I can't type. Um, No break just yet. So um, we're about to wrap up for the night on this chapter. Um, so we're not going to break. Um, we're not going to do chapter four tonight. We'll catch chapter four up at a later time. Um, that's going to go into some more of your uh, 
documentations. So we're gonna we're gonna not do that tonight. And uh, chapter four is communications and documentation. So we'll catch those up a little bit later. When we start clinicals, um, I know some of you all are, are further off than others. You all are welcome to come to the large metropolitan city of Collins, Mississippi, and and do your clinicals with me on the ambulance or in our emergency room. Uh, which question could there have been two answers? No. Question 10 is which of the following statements are false about your reports? Uh, A, legally, if it's not documented, it was not happened. Uh, it did not happen. So that's true. If you go to court, you can't legally claim something was done without having the documentation to prove that you actually performed it. So that's a true statement. Uh, letter B, a complete accurate report is an important safeguard against legal problems. That's also true. Um, a good report, a good narrative in your report is going to be what saves you from uh, legal problems in the future. You want to document accurately and thoroughly everything on that call. It's, it's just, it's a, it's just protection down the road from you. Uh, C is also true. An incomplete or untidy patient care report is evidence of incomplete or inexpert emergency medical care. And you, if you write a report and you can't spell dog and you can't spell cat and you can't spell hospital, um, when that gets to court, that doesn't project the image of an expert medical uh, care provider. So sloppy, misspelled, poor grammar, all of those. Um, and it brings to D, patient care does not become a part of the patient's hospital. That's, that statement is true because it absolutely does. So I hope I cleared that up. Um, but as I was saying, the clinicals, you get ready to do those. Uh, you all are welcome, uh, regardless of where you live. If you want to come uh, to our ER or ride with me or somebody else that um, that I pick for you if I'm not actually working. Um, I'm not a daytime person. I'm a nighttime person, so I only work nights. Um, probably will never be a daytime person. I'll have to quit before I work a day shift. But, you know, if anybody wants to work nights, do a ride. That's fine. ER, it, it could be day or night, whatever, whatever suits you. Uh, I just have a few people in the ER that I do. Um, I have selected for any students that want to come. Um, just like anywhere else, some are stronger, some are weaker. So uh, if anybody comes, I'm always going to have you with a, a stronger person. <clears throat> It's Covenant County Hospitals in Collins, Mississippi. I'm not sure if we currently have a clinical agreement with any of the hospitals in Hattiesburg. Um, I can I can answer a lot of these if you need me to for the uh, clinicals. I feel like no for Hattiesburg, but let Rob tell you definitely. So for EMT basic, you don't technically actually have to do ER time. The way the law is written is that you just have to do 48 hours of hands-on. So because of the level that you're learning, uh, historically EMT basics in the hospital don't do anything. Y'all wind up just holding up the wall for 24 hours. 
So we have opted to make all of your hands-on time be with your ambulance. Um, uh, if you go on to advanced EMT or paramedic, that's different. You will have to go to the hospital for that. But for EMT basic, it's just your ambulance. Now you guys come from a wide range, a geographic area. So we don't expect you to travel very far to go to the ambulance that you're gonna ride on. If you live in the Covington County area, you can do your ride alongs with them. If ASAP covers your area or AAA, AMR, Acadian, Pafford, um, anybody that we, you know, you'll be able to ride with them. We already have those agreements set up. I am going to be reaching out to y'all here soon to get the name of a local ambulance to you. If we've already got the agreement, fantastic. If not, then we'll have to build that while the class is going on. So I am going to be dealing with that um, sooner rather than later. The agreements are easy to set up, but I don't want to be at the end of the class trying to get legal documents sent back and forth kind of thing. Um, but yes, you'll. the only thing you might have to travel for will be the boot camp. Your actuals, your ride-alongs, unless there's some unforeseen issue where you know, the ambulance just doesn't take riders. I did find one ambulance company that doesn't, doesn't do student ride-alongs, you know, something like that. Uh, you should be able to ride in your area. And the worst case scenario is we just have to move you to the next closest, which might be the next county over something of that sort. But uh, that's all. So, yeah, it's it's hard to say who you're going to ride with just because it really just depends on where you're at. So the boot camps. Who's got questions about the boot camps? Kristen Brown. Um. So the boot camps in Mississippi are going to be, we have Pascagoula and we've got Hattiesburg as soon as their, their city COVID restrictions lift on the fire department, because that's where we're going to host it. Um, Covington County is willing to hold coastal boot camp. So you guys, if anybody's in the McGee, not McGee, uh, Collins area, even though we're close to Hattiesburg, you guys can go to Covington there as well. The closest to Lafayette currently is Alexandria. Um, now we are working on getting a, a location in Lafayette, but the hospital we were working at, their their building is not big enough, so we're still working on that one. For Indiana, yes, y'all will be at Shipshawana at the fire department. That was um, we've been working with them for you guys since the beginning, so that's where y'all are going to go. You won't have to come all the way down here. Let's see, uh, Louisiana. Like I said, we have Alexandria. We've got Abita Springs. We're working on something up closer to Monroe and, and Shreveport, and we're also working on something closer to Lafayette, but we don't have those yet. We do have something near Birmingham, uh, close to Pell City, just a little bit east. Tennessee, we've got a place just outside of Nashville and just south of Memphis. Let's see. Um, where are we going to do in Alexandria? It's a little bit east of Alexandria. It's in uh, Rapids Parish, not actually in the town, not actually in the town. Arkansas, we don't have anything yet. I'm working on something in Little Rock, but it's not open. I don't want to. I don't want to claim that one until we've got it more in the back than we do because we're still on preliminaries with them. Yeah, no, no, I'm sorry. Let me rephrase that. It's eastern side of the parish. I think it's actually called East Rapids. Mississippi, like I said, we've got um, Hattiesburg, Collins, and Pasadena. If there is a fire department or, and it is for any of y'all, if there's a fire department, say, in North Mississippi, like around the Tupelo area, um, that you think might be interested in hosting a boot camp, let me know. We can work it out, try to get it going with them, and then that way you've got something local. For y'all that are way up at the top of the state, you'd probably be better off going to our Memphis location. Let's ride along so there are a certain amount of things we have to document, or is it just the hours? It's technically at your level, it would just be the hours, uh, but we will give you a sheet where you can document the runs you've done. So just so that we have something in your portfolio to say, you know, hey, you ran three traumas and 25,000 stub toes and, you know, stomach aches or something. Um, yes, we do have the agreement with Pafford. 
it's a hospital just south of Memphis, uh, right just north of the state line. Any other questions? Boot camp will be five days. I uh, know I have not reached out to Youngsville. Where are they up at the top of the state? Or maybe, okay, in the bio, hey, perfect. Uh, if you can get me their information, somebody that I might be able to talk to, be it a ACA training or even the chief, if that's who covers it, uh, we can go ahead and try to start that conversation and see if they're interested. Because I do want something in that area. I, we just don't have it yet. Absolutely. Hey, um, I'm active. I know I don't post a lot, but I am always watching the Facebook group. If y'all have any questions, we can, you can obviously ask them there. I'll answer as fast as I can. Uh, your hours for what, for the, like, what are the boot camps run? Uh, usually it's like eight to four business hours round about, um, give or take as the as the days go on sometimes we'll end a little earlier it may run a little late it just depends on the size of the crowd how fast we're moving how fast y'all pick things up if you show up to boot camp and nobody knows their assessments it's gonna t it's gonna slow us down but if y'all show up and you know you're ready to go you've memorized your assessments all that stuff we'll fly through a lot of it it's gonna go it'll go quick i've seen it on both extremes We don't pay for the hotels. We leave that up to y'all. That way you have the choice of where you stay. Not to mention, not everybody's going to need a hotel. Um, some people may choose something completely different. Now, something that we've done, and I've, I've seen other programs do this, um, as y'all get to know each other, you may find that you want a roommate with somebody. You make a friend in the class, y'all want to split the bill. That's entirely up to y'all, obviously, but I mean, it does, it will help a lot with that particular portion of the, of the bill. We just leave it to y'all. That way I'm not making decisions for somebody that you may not like. And there's a group of five or six that want to room together. You may get lucky and find a cheap Airbnb and not do a hotel and just split the cost of a house between six people um, for that week. That, that would save you some money. Yeah, I know it's hotels can rack up expenses pretty quick. It is five days. It'll be a Monday through Friday, so if you do have to get a hotel, typically uh, you'll want to aim for a Sunday night through a Thursday night. That way you're there to get ready for class and then you check out Friday morning before you show up for the last day and go home from there. Um, it's just the, the normal way, but it's entirely, it's, like I said, entirely up to y'all. As far as the dates go, I should have boot camp dates available, I'd say in the next week or two. Um, I need to look and see. I got to plot out all of y'all's locations and figure out which which boot camp locations are going to have people. I may have a boot camp location that nobody's near. So once I get that figured out, then I can start scheduling the dates. But I will say that your boot camps will be in May. <laughs> I can, I can give you the month. Uh, the week is still to be determined. All right, that's, that's all I got. Um, I do want to say this. I know that we have sent out the walkthroughs before the class started, but there has been some breakdowns in communication. Some people haven't gotten emails from me. 
if you haven't gotten the emails on or you haven't already done signing up on NREMT, um, getting into Canvas. I see somebody said they're having a problem with Canvas. Let me know. We'll try to work through it. But if y'all haven't gotten those or gotten set up with the Louisiana Bureau of EMS, um, try to get on that. And if you need help, let me know. The airport in Alexandria. And the okay. Um, yeah, especially if you've got like bigger rooms. I haven't been out there yet. It's it is the colon, if I'm not mistaken. Is that's that's where it's at. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna see that location for the first time in about three weeks because we're doing our first boot camp there this month. Awesome. It's, I'm, I'm assuming it's easy parking and stuff like that. I know that airports have a lot of secure areas. Cool. I'll meet you in advance. Uh, as far as the NREMT website, get with me offline on that one. I'll have to figure out who we need to talk to to get you your access restored. But we're skipping Chapter 4. The next class will be Chapter 5. Med terminology. <laughs> there shouldn't be a quiz for. Um, if there, is, I'm pretty sure there's not. I'll double check it. But no, we don't. I don't. We don't lecture on the um, on the documentation chapter because you guys are so spread out, all your documentation is different. I can't teach you one form, it's a waste of time. Uh, and I don't have enough time to teach you all of your forms. Yep, all right, so that one, I'm gonna hand it back to Brad for that. He's, he's the master of the codes. All right, tonight's code. It's going to be very similar to Monday night's code. It's 4312 pound 2. And if you said develop and trend, it will change next week. So it's not going to be 4312 pound 3. So it won't be re repetitive after, after tonight. So we'll be back Thursday of next week. Um, give you plenty of time to read chapter five. Um, you can you can go back and review all the previous chapters up until five. Read five two. Um, that's eight days. You'll have plenty of time to um, keep yourself reading up and refreshed on what we've been through so far. Um, chapter five won't really be that hard. Um, it's just new terminology to, to some of you. And once you learn what root words are and suffixes and prefixes and all that, you'll be able to, um, you'll be able to get this stuff and put it together. Um, Then we'll go over some body orientation um, terms, anterior, posterior, superior, inferior, stuff like that. Um, body positions, prone fowlers, semi-fowlers. Um, we'll get into that uh, Thursday of next week. So just go ahead and start reading up that chapter, and maybe you'll know most what I'm going to present to you by then, and we can get it knocked out, moved on, and um, hopefully soon you start getting to the more meat and potatoes, um, assessments and treatments, and all the the funner stuff, and get out of some of this more mind numbing uh, stuff that we're on currently. Um, so. 
just refresh and review what we've been over so far, read chapter five, and we'll be back here Thursday evening to pick back up with the terminology. Other than that, uh, I don't have anything else for you. Uh, if anybody has any questions before we go, feel free to throw them out. If something comes up between now and then, um, I go back to work tomorrow night. I'll work the next seven nights. Um, shoot me a text uh, when I wake up. I'll see that. Um, I'll see what you sent, and I'll, I'll address it and answer it best I can. Um, so, if nobody has anything, we'll just call it right here. And uh, see y'all Thursday night. Thank you.